the Chairs Air Pollution Seminar. Today, um, the title of the presentation is Regional Commercial Marine Vessel Inventories and the Forecast. As you may know, the ship emissions contribute significantly to the air pollution in remote ocean areas, coastlines, and imports. ARB has worked on the emission inventory analysis and the regulation of air pollution from waterborne shippings for more than two decades. And this particular project is, was funded by ARB in conjunction with CC. The speaker today is Professor Jim Kobe. He's, the, he's an associate professor in the University of Delaware, Graduate College of Marine Studies and in Civil and Environmental Engineering. His research has focused on transportation and the environment, including technology policy research on air emissions from international and domestic marine time, transport, energy, and the environmental impacts of multi-model fleet transportation, and assessment of technological and policy control strategies for good movement. Without further ado, let us welcome Professor Jim Kobe. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I look forward to sharing with you the results of this research and then uh, engaging in dialogue that uh, hopefully uh, this will inspire. Um, the picture up here represents uh, a one global representation of ship traffic intensity. Um, and uh, in this picture, as you've seen the animations move, um, it's shifting between a winter and a summer perspective on the major intense routes. Um, ships that are traveling on a time constrained basis will take the path of shortest arrival, and sometimes that means avoiding winter storms. And so you'll see the shift to the north to avoid uh, mid-ocean storms. And, um, and so you'll see that that sort of a representation creates uh, one, one uh, view of, of the dynamic nature of shipping, which makes this project so fun. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you how we went from here to something more uh, complete for North America. Um, the objectives of the project were essentially four, uh, was, were to uh, prepare some sort of spatially resolved baseline inventory for commercial marine vessels and their emissions, um, to evaluate how that large scale regional model, continental model, would compare with uh, the, the state-of-the-art port-based, activity-based inventories at the ports, then to take that inventory and, and uh, forecast how it might change in the future uh, in response to things like technology and trade, primarily growth and freight movement, um, and then to look at how that would uh, be mitigated or moderated by potential international level policy action, including something called the SICA, a Sulfur Emission Control Area, which is a special area under international treaty at the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, under something they call Annex 6 to the MARPOL Treaty. Of course, uh, a, a key part of, of this project's motivation was west coast of the U.S. and California specific, but the interest is broader than that, and our uh, approach was more broad than that. So we uh, joined with, with uh, other folks to broaden the scope such that it was a North American uh, act, uh, activity. And in fact, you'll see it's a, it's a global model that was designed to achieve a regional inventory. Quick overview and summary. Over the next couple of slides, I'm going to give you the short version of the talk, and then we'll go into some of the details of the project. Um, we, we we provided a North American inventory for the base year 2002 using what we uh, believe to be the best practices. That is an activity-based inventory looking at ship uh, 
operation activity, the engines themselves, their operating hours and their behaviors, and then uh, using, coupling that with the most current power-based emissions factors. Um, we also, uh, through a, a really substantial dialogue with, primarily with folks at ARB, but with folks in, in, uh, involved in the whole uh, SICA team, we thought about uh, what would be the basis for making forecast extrapolations, and we uh, decided to use a installed power basis for forecasting. I'll go into some more reasons why, but, but in general, that's a first-order indication of how much energy would be used by those engines. And we think that the first-order indication was the best one we could come up with, even though uh, the only thing better than that would be a continuous emissions monitor over time. Um, forecasts, then, are primarily extrapolations. I want to make sure that, uh, that as I convey with great confidence how we came up with these forecasts, I point out that they were designed to be rather are um, generic and not overly specified like a, like a typical uh, uh, environmental scenario that you might have seen under IPCC, et cetera. We tried to articulate a bounded range of possible futures to get broad insights um, rather than to try to articulate uh, one conditional set of, of possible futures. So in terms of some of our results, um, we found, and it's baseline 2002, I apologize for the typo there, uh, that we found that, uh, that ships calling on North America, uh, about 170,000 of those ships call, uh, 100, about 170,000 ship calls occur every year. And when you map those globally through the routes, their origins and destinations, um, we estimate that there's about 47 uh, million tons of fuel used per year, and that uh, uh, corresponds to about 2.4 million tons of SO2 or sulfur uh, emitted globally. Within the domain that you'll see in the pictures, the number is a little bit smaller, and it turns out to be about 30 million tons within the North American domain that was, that was selected, and about 1.6 million tons of SO2. The growth rate is high on a uh, North American average. The, the growth in emissions and energy consumption appear to be close to 6% per year. Again, within uh, a bounded range that we'll discuss. And the point then of, of those results is that the ship emissions appear to be growing faster than the economy. Um, that team seems to make sense and it's being confirmed by other studies independent of ours. Um, and uh, what that then means is that a IMO level uh, mitigation like a SICA, the, CICA, the current SICA compliance requirements, um, which would represent a substantial reduction in the sulfur content of the fuel being used, would be offset by the growth in activity um, within, uh, within less than 20 years. This is a picture of those results um, in terms of the baseline inventory, and I've chosen uh, for simplicity, I suppose, not to give you the SO2 numbers, but to give you the, the carbon dioxide numbers because it, 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 they all are proportional. You can't tell the difference. And uh, this is really the energy basis, power basis, by which we make our forecasts. Um, and uh, what you'll notice here is that there are major routes that come into and out of North America, and um, uh, those major routes tend to hug the coastline for a lot of ship activity, and they tend to be transatlantic or cross-ocean, trans-Pacific, I guess, for this audience, um, with, uh, uh, with important, uh, you know, in terms of, terms of their voyages. Yes? Yes, and Gulf. 170,000 calls into North America represents calls into all the ports that, uh, that you would see for those, I don't think this part's going to work. Um, anyway, yes, and I'll show you a couple slides that'll get you at those ports. But yes, we'll show you that they probably are not, and we'll show you that we didn't make that that um, step in this first work. Um, this is a uh, table from the report that shows you the emissions, and we broke these emissions out by coastline and by nation. And uh, what we've decided to call coastal for simplicity, for arbitrary simplicity, was out to the 200 nautical mile zone or the exclusive economic zone, the EEZ. 
Now, this is an eye chart, so I decided to try to show this in a different way. And uh, if you were to look at the split across the various pollutants, uh, the blue representing the within 200 nautical miles, or what we call coastal, and the red representing the non-coastal, um, it's, it's uh, a little bit more than one-third within the coast, coastal regions and, uh, and the rest non-coastal. Another way of looking at that is to see that it's, it's about 35% coastal, um, close enough to shore that if the winds were right that you'd clearly see potential um, transport. Um, subject, again, to more detailed modeling. That's not a statement of, of, of obvious outcomes. It wouldn't be 100%. And then if you break that out according to that table, even a little more detailed, uh, what you'll see here across the, the legend from bottom up is the U.S. regions. And in the blue, you see that the West Coast represents something between 13 and 15 percent of our North American inventory. Um, in terms of these, now this, is, this represents just the coastal portion, by the way. But in, within the coastal portion, uh, about 13 percent is U.S. West Coast. A little bit more is U.S. East Coast. And U.S. altogether represents more than half, nearly 60 percent of the coastal, within coastal region emissions in North America based on the data that we have. The other major conclusion in terms of forecasts is that at a, uh, a 5.9 percent annual growth rate uh, and making a, a hypothetical um, are partly, partly our choice as the researchers, hypothetical delineation out to 200 miles, that the future emissions with IMO compliance would be about one and a half times greater than today's. And without IMO compliance, they'd be about 2.8 times what they are today. And that would be represented, the blue is 2.8 and the red is 1.5. So the point is that while a future IMO would reduce 2020 emissions by about 700,000 700, metric tons, it would be an increase over today's emissions by about 2 million metric tons. And um, so that we could understand the sensitivity of that future scenario with a growth rate that some would maybe consider high, like 5.9% per year, we ran that with also an uh, alternate more... more um, more intuitively expected growth rate of 3.6 percent, and you see that that even then the um, the future emissions in 2020 are offset. Uh, well, maybe they're still offset before 2020 at an IMO level of of one and a half percent. Only when you drop below 0.5 percent sulfur limit in the fuel within that zone do you extend the period where switchover occurs out past up to around 2030. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the methodologies and uh, validating work that we did as part of this research. I'm going to begin with the baseline ship inventory work. And um, I want to acknowledge that uh, the baseline ship inventory work perhaps represents uh, activities that we were doing before this, this uh, funded work came, but, but were leveraged and really focused into some insights during this work. And that the forecasting work was done with very substantial uh, and, and highly insightful help from ARB staff. And uh, that's, that's, um, that's something that, that um, I want to make sure I acknowledge, at least for the few people in the room that spent nearly as many hours as we did on that. The point of these uh, next slides is that beginning with a proxy, a representation of ship traffic like the globe that you saw at the beginning, we tried to develop a network of shipping routes that would uh, address the limitations of a proxy and then solve analytically for, for a set of known voyages. Um, this is a, another animation that shows you by vessel type how uh, the current representation of ship traffic may look. And uh, I invite you to think of your favorite thing that's shipped, whether it's oil or uh, merchandise and then, or bananas, and then pick the color that represents the ship that would carry it and see how different those routes are from the other kinds of cargo routes. Um, the point here really is just to represent heterogeneity. This is not a single source that looks homogenous, that operates some um, uniform set of activities offshore. It's, um, it's at least as varied as Joseph Conrad would have said in the early 1900s. Um, 
This is a static version of the same thing. And the point here, again, is just to emphasize that there are major roots and there are minor roots. And that when you zoom in and overlay those major and minor roots, it empirically seems that these are roots that represent goods movement because they connect very well with where the major trucking routes are. And had I shown you the rail routes, you would again see very good um, connectivity with what is really one freight system with multiple modes. So what we did is we worked to integrate that top-down picture of pixels, which are uh, populated by self-reporting ships, um, which means that it's a biased sample of those who participate in that data set and tried to connect with bottom-up measures, which would tend to count every arrival and departure, and then work to model those activities um, and, and superpose them as, the, as necessary. We used 20 years of that ship proxy data that you've been seeing, um, and we used um, a one year of what, what would be considered our best, most complete data set of 170,000 arrivals and departures. And, um, and then by using GIS tools to create a network, we could then solve the, the, the voyage pairs for uh, the location and then uh, associate those pairs with the engine characteristics and operating characteristics along each segment. Uh, a couple of quick slides. I hope to go quickly through these. These are some validating steps that we took to, uh, to try to convince ourselves that the network approach could be derived from these biased top-down proxies. Uh, there are two different top-down data sets that you can compare and use. One is, is called ICOADS, and for the presentation, I won't define the acronym, and the other is called AMVER. Um, they're in the report. And if you use ICOADS, which is this representation on the – I'm sorry, this is, this is still – no, this is all ICOADS, and this is um, the 20-year uh, data set on the left and, um, and then the summer traffic on the right – if you compare the 20-year data set with the last three years, you see that the, the routes themselves are not migrating over time very much. Um, you'll see the same traffic patterns in the recent period as in the longer period. That allowed us to depend upon the longer period to produce more highly resolved shipping network uh, segments. And then on the, sorry, on the right, you'll see the seasonality that I showed you in that first slide represented pretty well. We expected to see seasonality. We knew that as uh, that the ship operators do that. We saw it in the data. So we had good confidence that it was representing that. And then this is an overlay on the left of the last three years. And on the right, it's a differencing of where the summer's higher in the warm colors and where the winter's higher in the blue colors. Again, uh, using different proxies where I was starting to go when I thought I was on this slide is that you can use the ICOADS or you can use the AMVER. And while they're populated with different self-reporting samples, they still depict the same traffic patterns, but with interestingly different intensities. And you can see that uh, overlaid this way. So then what we did is we, we spent some time um, going through these revealed traffic patterns. And like you might think of doing if you had a map of automobile traffic, but no map of the highways, we, we looked at where traffic was dense and broad and said, that looks like a freeway. And we looked at where, where traffic was sparse and, and single file, and we said, that looks like a country road. And we drew a network based on where we saw the, the connectivity. Um, and we connected that, uh, the question earlier, we connected it to the ports that our data set said were the ports being uh, vo where the voyages were occurring from or to. We then coded our vessel data so that where vessels were too big to go through the, the choke points, we broke the network so that they couldn't choose the shortest path and they would have to take the longest path so that we could make sure that we were realistically routing very, very large vessels uh, around um, these canals. And um, uh, I will skip over this, I think, but what we did is we associated a, a set of relationships within the GIS slash database combination, um, and uh, we were able then to derive the emissions that would occur in each segment. Um, and this is an example of a solved route where uh, at the lower, at the upper, the green dot to the upper left represents place number one, and place number two is in the blue, 
and we would tell the network to find the shortest path through this network. And you can see that it chooses a path that is reasonably similar to the kinds of traffic patterns that a captain on a ship would navigate. Again, you've seen these before. So for repetition, um, I will go quickly through them. So that's how our baseline inventory was produced. Um, this slide represents um, in, in step one here how the registering nations, the nations that uh, register these vessels, what flags these vessels would be flying. And, um, and you see that the, the depiction represents pretty well a world fleet mix, if you're familiar with the world fleet flags of registry. And if you look at it by vessel type, you'll find that the main engine power and the number of uh, ships are not always correlated, particularly for container ships, but that the SOX emissions and the main engine power are well correlated. And uh, you can see how um, those three outcomes would break down by vessel type. This will come back in some of the concluding remarks that I'll make. And they refer back to the idea of forecasting in terms of some future work. So we end up with this pattern. And again, this pattern connects at least as well as the top-down proxy pattern with the on-road freight movements that we see, or surface freight movements that we see. Then we looked at how um, the top-down proxy and our bottom-up network compare. And what we see, you'll notice, I think I'll point you at the U.S. East Coast one, the second column. We notice pretty good agreement on the East Coast between ICOADS, this uh, self-reported sample, and East Coast traffic. And we represent... Um, uh, we under our model uh, produces less SOX emissions on the West Coast than you would get from the data sample, the top-down data sample. One of the reasons for this is that ICOADS, as a self-reported data sample, is designed for weather reporting data so that ships that are moving with a time sensitivity know when to avoid bad weather. Container ships participate very substantially in this data set. They're a biased participant in the top-down ICOADS data. And so on the East Coast, which has quite a bit of container shipping, the two match up pretty well. Bottom up and top down match pretty well. On the West Coast, ICOADS over represents traffic intensity because there's a substantial amount of tanker traffic in addition to a substantial amount of container traffic for West Coast North American ports. And in the Gulf Coast, um, the ICOAD sample, which is underrepresenting tankers, does more poorly than a more bottom-up complete representation would do. And then we compared this with what we determined to be the, either the most recent and or the most um, advanced uh, port-based inventories. All of these are activity-based inventories. They don't represent a scaling or a uh, proportional assumption. They, they counted and did the best they could with those, and they are all, I think, uh, among the state of the art. And we did this for a large region in Western Canada um, and, a, and the Great Lakes, where there was some activity uh, either jointly or, or involving Canada or dominating uh, work out of Canada. And then we looked at the Port of Los Angeles, Houston, Galveston, and New York, New Jersey. And what you'll notice is, um, is important differences in other words, some comparisons are higher than those port-based inventories and others are lower than those port-based inventories. And while we would love to see perfect agreement, we never expected that. What we were happy to see is that we didn't have a bias where our inventory always overestimated or always underestimated. The fact that we are on both sides suggests that there's room for improvement, but we don't have systematic bias. We then moved to forecasting, and the point of the next slides would be that uh, we developed uh, what, what I will uh, suggest or label as bounded forecasts. We tried to evaluate a variety of trend lines uh, in order to understand whether economics were in agreement with energy statistics, which might be in agreement or not in agreement with recent uh, uh, emissions forecasts by various agencies. Um, and uh, as an example, I will tell you the IMOs, the International Maritime Organization's forecast, had, a, uh, had assumed in 2000 in their greenhouse gas study something like a 3% per year growth rate. Um, 
and, um, and it was essentially meant to match trade. We needed to see if uh, other forecasts of emissions that were more flat were better uh, or whether other forecasts of freight activity, which were very steep and compounded, were better. So these were the two tasks that I'll focus on in the next slides. Um, our basic questions that we decided that we, that we knew we had to pose for ourselves is what are the patterns currently and what is the intensity currently? And we let the baseline inventory uh, serve that purpose for us. And then we needed to know what's the right trend and what's the right pattern. And you'll notice that we worked hard on the trend and, um, and uh, made some simplifying assumptions on the pattern. <coughs> we had a bunch of options, as I've almost uh, over-summarized already, so I'll let you skim through these. Um, we could basically do what's been done at the national level before. We could look at the port-based numbers, which were much, much higher in terms of what they were expecting, especially in the West Coast. We could create detailed scenarios of what might happen, which the IPCC and, and others have done. Um, all, uh, the other thing is we could look at the, the trade routes themselves and, and, um, and try, to, try to look at that. So we, we worked uh, around all of those for a while and uh, essentially came up with some principles for how we would choose. Um, that what we wanted to do is make sure that our forecast domain was broad, um, that we used multiple perspectives that we considered the work and energy relationship of moving stuff uh, because that would get us calibrated, we thought, unless there were reasons for decoupling energy and work. And uh, then we would try to recognize that this is a heterogeneous process, so we would uh, avoid being too simple or at least acknowledge when we were. And then we would look for surprise and try to avoid being overconfident, which is one of the major uh, limitations of many forecast exercises, particularly related to environment um, and sometimes related to economics. So uh, we, we ended up looking at ways to choose our growth patterns. And if we had continuous emissions monitors that were monitoring for the last 15 years, we would have just used those. But in the absence of that, we looked at power-based trends as a first order indicator of the emissions, particularly for ships which have installed power designed to be used at steady state most of their life. Um, different perhaps than, than automobiles, which are designed to have power available to pass on a hill and take off at the green light and may not use all that power. Ships use that power um, uh, by design. We, uh, we looked at but did not pick up vessel size and speed, which were proxies that have been used before because installed power is the sum or nonlinear combination of the power and energy required to push bigger and faster. So we, we thought that that uh, was the best first order. Um, we also considered cargo throughput statistics. They tended to, um, well, we considered those and some others, and we can talk more about those. So we chose what we thought was the first order proxy. If you uh, look at our power-based trends, and we did this on two different levels. Um, the level that we did and discussed mostly in the report was using port-specific history for the last seven or so years in terms of the installed power, sum of installed power arriving on these voyages. And um, what you'll see in these dotted there's squares and the ones with the little points is a steep extrapolation, unbounded exponential fit of the data points in the sort of gray squares. In the light gray triangles, we see a linear fit which, um, which is how we started. Linear extrapolations were currently being used for the environmental work. Um, the, the problem was that linear extrapolations for energy and environment were in direct conflict with the economic forecasts, which all compounded. And my sense was that if the work being done, the freight being moved, serving the economy is growing at a compounding rate, then unless I can explain decoupling, so is the energy. Um, and then on the other hand, an unbounded, an unbounded exponential growth curve goes to infinity pretty soon. And that's not reasonable either because the economy has recessions and other negative feedbacks that occur. If I knew when they were, I would know when to sell my house. But since I don't, um, we decided to use an average, really an arbitrary average of the exponential and linear fits. And that's in the blue. What you notice is if you put the um, 
arbitrary fit that we did to recent data next to the no net increase rather detailed scenario of what the future would look like in the sort of red fuzzy, um, you see that we end up at the same place except that they were articulating an investment strategy in terms of ship power, et cetera, that was more attuned to their real plans. So we are not articulating the path, but we think we're getting similar endpoints if, if you go out a decade or two. We also thought whether that made any sense. And if you look at recent container ship uh, trends, and this goes back to 1980, you will see, uh, actually there's three curves here. Some go back to 1997, and this was our data. And you'll see in the um, dark red and the blue, uh, let's see the dark red and the green, you'll see imports and exports. And you know, uh, if you look at trade data, that there's a deficit, and the deficit is, it has been growing, that we import more than we export. And if you look at this, it shows you recent growth rates in our exports versus recent growth rates in our imports. Ships are the same ships that bring our imports are being used for the exports, so we don't have to look at two different kinds of ships doing those jobs. And the average growth rate of the two is in the blue with the diamonds. What's not well, and well revealed in some of the cargo throughput statistics is that there's a lot of empty boxes that are moved in return, and you'll see in the fuzzy line going back to 1980 from another data source, the total TEU throughput, whether empty or full, and you'll see that um, from, from say, uh, around 27 in 2005 for the, the blue diamond line up to 40, not quite double, but there's a substantial amount of empty movements that are really serving the goods movement process but aren't moving revenue cargo. Um, we then focused in on by vessel type, and if you look at the uh, trends of, of uh, container traffic. The yellow dots represent data points, um, and, um, and the blue dots represent our average of the unbounded and linear extrapolations. Um, that compares very well with some other work that was being done in the SICA team at the time. And again, when you compare that with cargo movement themselves, what we're saying is that we see continuous, nearly monotonic increases in goods movement, this is only showing what's, what's uh, posted under international seaborne trade, but more and more the seaborne trade is a trip generator for multimodal goods movement. And you'll see that we, if we were good statisticians without thinking about underlying economics, we would say this is something we would want to fit a line to, these data points. If you think like an economist and you look at all the studies, they have always shown compounding growth and so we fit exponential curves to this data, and we have a series of regimes in which the economies were growing at different rates according to different exponentially calibrated curves with negative feedbacks where there's recessions, energy shocks, and some other things, events you may remember. So we said, well, how does that all compare? Because we are more worried about being wrong in our forecast than we are about being perfectly right. And if you compare the seaborne trade statistics you see that the trends are pretty similar. And this is now showing on the y-axis an index with whatever data in these data sources was closest to 2002 being one. So it's 2000, 2001, or 2002 data. And if you look at the energy forecasts, the sales statistics, um, you see that it's a little bit flatter. And this is from some published work and also from recent statistics coupled with a, um, a developing energy model. Um, that was not ours. The point is that when you overlay all of these, you see a trend that you may have some confidence in. And the way I tend to think of it is that if um, you will allow an assumption that the outlying forecasts, the extremely optimistic economically based forecasts, or the fuel sales based only economic forecast, and that data is somewhat incomplete, um, if those are the bounding ones, and therefore perhaps less likely, then the ones that converge toward the middle might represent a likelier forecast. And the point here is that emissions in the future are on track to double at least by 2050 if you follow the green line, and by 2030 if you follow the middle of the pack. And in terms of North America, they're on track to double much more quickly than that. 
These were the growth rates that we derived from the empirical port arrival data, the power-based data that trends that we, we used for each of the ports. And um, I think I've got a variety of California-centric numbers here, but I also show the, the broader ones, including New York, New Jersey, and, uh, and then these larger, more regional scale forecasts. So the insights, I think, are in this handout. I will probably skip them for time. Um, the main thing, I think I've uh, talked about all of that. Uh, the last point I'll make, though, is that, that the, we felt rather encouraged that these power-based forecasts with the arbitrary averaging of the two extrapolations tended to be reinforced by all the other data we could find. And, and uh, to be honest, I spent a lot of time trying to find anybody that could tell me where the knee and the curve would be. And, um, and, and we weren't able to find one. So the power-based trends seem to be robust. Um, our averaging may be a lower bound, depending upon how you see the, the future of engine te technologies. Um, so now to discuss the results. Uh, two main points I've already said. The reductions under current IMO policy would be offset by growth. And uh, in order to, to, to achieve long-term mitigation of impacts, either uh, of future increased impacts or even of impacts today that may be unacceptable, um, the targets would have to be more stringent than IMO. So we produced these forecasts for 2010 and 2020. Getting back to the original question, we did not rec recognize heterogeneity in ship patterns by vessel type when we did this. And in order to keep things coherent, to avoid discontinuities, we did not split shipping lanes between West Coast, Gulf Coast, between U.S. and Mexico, because they're continuous routes. And we grew them at a single national or a single North American growth rate. And you'll, you'll, you'll hear me talk more about that in a, in a few minutes. This was um, our hypothetical domain for the sulfur emission control area. We did it arbitrarily using a 200 nautical mile buffer, which will slightly differ depending upon how you interpret international law for where the EEZ needs to be. And then we show that there are reductions in the future on the left hand side of about 700,000 metric tons with a CICA in those zones. But compared to the baseline, there's an increase. And again, I showed you that early. It's about one and a half times instead of 2.8, depending upon whether you do or do not have an IMO compliant CICA. So the question is, can you think of these emissions reductions policies as reductions policies or as modified increases in future emissions? Um, we, I don't think this is in your handout. In the report, we talk extensively about potential uncertainties. Um, there were some baseline uncertainties in terms of getting the close-in behavior as, of maneuvering vessels, um, et cetera. That's being addressed through a variety of means, some with us and some with others using the work and modifying it. Um, the extrapolation, um, we declare uncertainty and, uh, and, and yet uh, common convergence on the insights and, uh, and then ways that we can improve things. I'm going to show you one way we can improve things um, here, uh, well, there's three ideas for the future. Two of these, I think, are being worked. Um, one is that this, these inventories can help update what, uh, what work has already been done to evaluate potential exposure pathways and risk and health impacts um, that uh, ARB is very, very familiar with, with their Goods Movement Action Plan and authored. Um, we can model the heterogeneity that I showed you earlier better among major routes and ship types. I'll show you that that work has been proposed and is planned. Um, and then uh, we can do better at taking this really cool network and connecting it to what we know is a continuous network of multimodal freight movement and really get at directly at the goods movement issue from, from origin to destination, not just from port of entry to transfer facility. Um, so that repeats that. Here I want you to see a split that we've done as a prototype, actually funded under work aimed at understanding ship speeds in relation to marine mammals on the East Coast. So this is an East Coast set of pictures. 
um, supported by NOAA, not, not, uh, not part informed by this work, is, uh, is that on the left you'll see container ships and refrigerated cargo ships. And if you look at the growth rates by ship type, those are the two fastest growing types of shipping. Um, and on the right, you'll see tankers and bulk carriers. And if you look at the growth rates, those are the least fast growing ship types in terms of, of their installed power. Um, and what you see is difference in the ship patterns. The major routes for container ships don't look like the major tanker routes. If you were to forecast container shipping at 9 or 10 or 11 percent per year, which is what those curves earlier showed you for container ships, that means that these routes in the future may be double the tanker routes that are currently growing at 1, 1.5% 1 per year. Um, and so creating a superposition of the heterogeneity of these movements is something that we plan to do. Um, so uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the California Air Resources Board not only for support, in, in terms of the project's uh, budgets, but also with uh, partnership in terms of the analyses, especially for forecasts. Um, then some work that we've been doing on a global basis and some work that we've done under that rail re whale research grant, uh, all of which helped us uh, take what we've been collecting and developing as a really good way of representing where ships are into an activity-based model that can be used for multiple purposes, including these emissions inventories. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, we have some time for questions. Uh, before we do that, I just want to remind that the uh, mm. trade. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have some time for questions. And before I do that, I want to remind the uh, webcast viewers, if you have any questions, you can send your question to Costa, C-O-A-S-T-A-L-R-M at calepa.ca.gov. Okay, what questions? Okay, hold on for a second. Yeah, I, my name is Mike Wall. I work for ARB, and uh, my staff and I are working on a shore power regulation. Um, my understanding in terms of the growth here is based upon installed power for yes. the vessels. Uh, we don't know that the hoteling emissions would be uh, the same type of growth. Can you comment on perhaps that? We're, because growth is, is critical to our regulation. We're looking at the number of ships, how long they're in berth, we don't know that the installed power is, is commensurate with what we're looking at in terms of growth, uh, auxiliary engines specifically, and, and number of ships. Let me, um, let me respond to that by saying how I would go at the data rather than try to tell you what I think or might recall the data telling me specific with regard to the trends in auxiliary power. Um, it's a very, very important point that you make. If the if the numbers of trips are not necessarily increasing according to installed power, and they aren't, at least they haven't been since early 1930s, um, the um, similar kind of decoupling might occur with that auxiliary power that's installed. I would go back and look um, if the, the auxiliary power divided by the total engine power, including main and auxiliary. If that ratio is something like 10%, which is a reasonable guess as, you, as it varies among ship types. If it's 10% now and it was 10% 20 years ago, I would say the growth rates are coupled. If it's 10% now and it was 20% 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I would say they're decoupled. And I would then look at the trends and it, that ratio and then do some fancy, some, you know, some, some, some simple um, um, assumptions like we've done maybe and try to reproduce those to get a auxiliary engine growth curve. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Yes. 
<coughs> it's on. It's awesome. Okay, my name is Ron Turner, and I'm, my company is in constant contact with ARB. And I, my question is, uh, in terms of the fuel that's being used, and I think I know the answer is diesel, but uh, is that used in conjunction with ultra low sulfur, or and how does that? Uh, how are you in compliance with that when you're talking about sailing abroad or whatever? Okay. Um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me start very, very broadly making no assumptions. Um, the, the engines that we're talking about are all um, what the engineering community would say is auto-ignited, but that means it's a Rudolph diesel design. Okay. So they're all diesel engines. Right. It is perhaps... Uh, depending upon your perspective on what diesel fuel is, it is perhaps not proper to say that these are running on diesel fuel in the context of ultra low sulfur plus on road plus, uh, you know, in that context, these fuels are really different. Okay. Uh, these are fuels that will auto ignite under the right temperatures and pressures in a diesel designed cylinder. They are very high sulfur, very high mineral very thick, viscous fuels that in cold conditions would look more like tar. So um, they don't compare well to what the California US EPA on-road community would call ultra-low diesel, okay. ultra-low sulfur diesel. And ultra-low sulfur diesel for these ships is number two diesel with 1,000 ppm. So okay. well, how is the reduction of emissions being controlled? Because in my estimation, uh, and I, I might be wrong, uh, but uh, over time, my understanding is that ultra-low sulfur would damage any ship or any car, any uh, truck or whatever that's using sulfur. There are, um, I'll, I'll, I'll first direct you to some presentations that are posted on the ARB website, I don't know where, from last Tuesday's, two days ago's uh, Marine Technology, Marine Technical group, Working Group. We were focused on fuel switching. We discussed a lot about the potentials for uh, switching to a cleaner fuel to require greater operation, greater maintenance, perhaps greater risk of, of uh, maintenance issues. The, the, the bottom line that I would leave you with subject to your re-review of all those data, because it can be seen different ways, is that when these motors, when these marine diesel engines were introduced into the fleet to replace steam and coal-fired steam power, they always switched to a clean distillate diesel fuel every time they came close to shore because the heavy, awful marine fuels, residual fuels, were unstable during maneuvering. It's routine for these engines to be switched back and forth to cleaner fuels. However, we, the engineers have spent a lot of time helping make these fuels unifuel, so they wouldn't have to switch. They could still maneuver with great stability. The bottom line is once you've taught this animal to eat the worst fuel out there, giving it better stuff creates a change in its diet, but, hey, it can eat it. And, um, and the, the issues are important. They're non-trivial. So that flip comment you need to understand is, is meant to give you the context. You may have to change the cylinder lubricating oils. There may be some additional attention to what's currently automated and not happening very often. All of those things are rather marginal. The engine manufacturers were in great consensus at that workshop, in my opinion, that it's doable. The operators were in pretty good consensus that it's something that every one of their engineers knows on the day they get their license to sail on ships. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Tony? Thank you. Uh, your comment about the intermodal nature of the shipping and the growth in containers makes me wonder, uh, is there any emissions or economic motivation for enlarging the Suez and Panama canals so as to reduce the number of ships that can't go through those canals? Yes. Um, 
But is there an emissions benefit or once I'd love to model that, that and that? see. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, the fact is if you go and Google Panama Canal and expansion, you'll find that there's some active, I think it's the, con I don't know if they've cut the ribbon and start construction or if they've just secured the financing, but that's going to happen and I don't remember what the completion date is. Um, so yes, it, it will happen. I think it's interesting to ask the diversion question that you've posed. Let me just guess that less current traffic will be diverted than growth will be redistributed. And I don't think you'll see a decrease in ship traffic anywhere. You'll see a rebalancing of where the growth occurs when you have that expansion. So I'm not sure it actually, well, it depends on how you define reduction in CO2. It's the reduction from the non-expanded pathway that you might be able to quantify and reveal in a forecast. I just wanted to thank you. It's a very, very detailed presentation. But it occurs to me that given how less speedy, I guess, slowing to a crawl traffic both on rail and on, on, on roads is coming out of San Pedro or Long Beach or Oakland is, at some point, given the fact that we're going to go into a doubling and a tripling and what have you, at some point it's going to occur to somebody that those nodes of traffic are fully subscribed. At some point, it's going to occur to somebody to move the traffic to Prince Rupert or um, the new port that they're discussing in, in Baja. Is that going to substantially change the calculations that you have? Let me, uh, let me begin by, by um, responding as though the answer was an un unadulterated yes. Um, the forecasting by vessel type that uh, I think we could do here is uh, really valuable and it would still miss what you've described if that were to occur. If, uh, if a cross-border port or a new route were to be inserted into the globe, um, there would be some interesting changes in the destinations themselves, not just in the distances. Um, in other words, uh, uh, the question over here represented perhaps a chain, a substitution of dis destinations that would involve the Panama Canal, if uh, you could think that that could happen. Now, to take the other side, because I, I, I'm interested to understand that question better and more fully. I've been thinking a lot about it. Currently, most of the ports are not, are, most of the ports, first of all, are all growing. New York, New, New Jersey is also saying that I-95 will be at a crawl. At the end of the day, if the people consuming the cargoes are still in the same places, you still have to get them there. And if through the congested node is still the path of least resistance, it won't move. And the question is, at what point does a really long path through Prince Rupert all the way down to Arizona beat a congested path through the Port of LA along I-40? And, and economic geography will continue to help moderate those, those things. That said, there'll be room for growth and the growth may occur faster in those kinds of concepts. So there may be a shift in the market share of the new growing freight. But I, I have a hard time thinking there would be a, uh, that any port's going to see a loss in trade since the growth seems to overwhelm that redistribution. Paul Milky, Air Resources Board. Um, I'm wondering if you see a uh, slowdown of vessels as bills become more and more expensive, or I've seen that at this point, or predict that might happen. I could. But the reason the vessels got faster was not to save fuel. And the vessels have been shifting in, in around 1980. Round numbers, I have the data somewhere. Something like 10% of the ton miles moved by ships were being moved by container ships. Something around 10%. It might have been 5%. That's 1980. In, in 1999, 
Well, if you, if you have to extrapolate a little, the 1999 is when the data leaves. Somewhere around now, it's about one-third, a little less, of, of the cargo is being moved by vessels that are essentially the very fastest in the fleet. They are the most energy intensive in the fleet. Two-thirds of the installed power in the fleet is on container ships today. Back in 1980, it wasn't two-thirds of the installed power on container ships. So the point I think I see is that the supply chain and logistics business models currently demand reliability, and, they, and we use speed to serve reliability. Until there's a different way of meeting reliability by relaxing just-in-time demands to uh, allow for greater storage and inventory or through other means, I don't know that the fuel price of one mode will change the supply chain. Um, again, it's an interesting question, and I think there is a place at which that would occur. I'm not sure that I can see it in the, in the domain of this forecast. Um, but uh, hopefully, if it is there, it's still in our bounds. Thanks again.